All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. We are starting officially. Uh, my name is Johnson Wala, and I'm happy to welcome all of us to today's workshop. Uh, this is Safe O'Clock Health and Safety Interactive Workshop, where we gather weekly to discuss important health and safety topics selected for the week. So for this week, we are talking about management of workplace chemical and biological hazards. So we have uh, uh, some of our participants presenting today. So we start from Mr. Steven. After Mr. Steven, uh, uh, Engineer Mohamed will start, then before I come uh, in place. So uh, Steven, you can have the floor. Okay, um, good evening, everyone especially for those who are within the Middle East, at least we, we have approached evening, you know? So uh, basically, um, I will not be projecting my slide because uh, I, I was unable to prepare um, comprehensively like the way I normally do because I have a little tight schedules and from here I'll be jumping into another, um, into a classroom, you know, so uh, coupled with um, IOSH program at hand, you know, so definitely I would just like to um, run through, um, I think the biological hazard, I would just want to focus a little bit based on our time, because I've seen that Mr. Justin has prepared something, probably he will be able to speak more on the chemical aspect and also for other speak, um, speakers who are here so that at least there will be room for, for us to have um, a broader view to this um, uh, presentation. So basically, um, when we talk about management of workplace chemical and biological hazard, as we all know as a professional, we know what hazard is all about. We know we are familiar with those chemical hazard and also biological hazard. So now, what is the question? How do we manage? We need to like reiterate some facts. We need to refresh ourselves um, with the knowledge we already have, uh, except for those who are just new or probably just joining us who do not have an uh, idea about what we are talking about. So basically, what it means is that in the workplace, workers may ex be exposed to a wide range of chemical or biological hazard that can pose serious health risk. Okay, that can pose serious ethics to that worker. Now, this hazard can come from various sources. The source could be in a liquid form, it could be in a solid, gaseous form, it could be from fumes and even infectious agents. Okay, so now it is important that we understand an effective uh, way of managing this hazard so that at least we can have an healthy working environment for all employees. So um, for me, when we talk about management of hazards, there is this basic hierarchy of control, which is fundamental that we all know, okay? Which is elimination, substitution, engineering control, administrative control, and the use of PPE. So you see, in, in some cases, this, this um, hierarchy of control exists in every form of management of hazard or risk in the workplace because Yes, we must be, we should be able to follow those steps, except when we find out that in this kind of hazard that is present in the site, probably we cannot eliminate. In some situations, we are unlikely to eliminate, but we have the option to substitute. In some cases, we cannot eliminate, we cannot substitute, but for sure, the third stage of control we always set in, irrespective of how difficult or complex that hazard is. At least at the third phase, which is engineering control, administrative and PPE, we surely set in no matter how critical and stubborn, eh? uh, in quotes, this hazard might be or the situation might be. So, because in some cases, why I say elimination is that they, are just, they just have to be there. Some, some substances just have to be used. So in such situation, what can we do? So that is where 
the focus, they will not be more focused on the engineering, administrative, and PP, like I've said. Now, the importance, one thing is I want us to understand that the important, the basic important why we manage workplace hazard, irrespective of either chemical or biological and others, is to prevent injury and illness, as we all know, and also to be compliant with legal requirements, you know, and also to enhance or boost the company's reputation to also motivate workers, you know, to um to increase worker retention, absenteeism, and all that. So all these things we are familiar with in most of our topic we discuss, all these things comes in. You understand? And it saves the company a lot. A lot. Because when people seek the absent from work, when people get injured, the absence from work, you know, things like that. And if it is if it if it involves fatality, we know how the cost implication could be in an organization. So all these things, we are so much familiar with them. So now, it, it, the, the reason we need to understand the legal, it, there's a legal requirement or regulation that we need to understand. Like when you talk about the chemical aspect now, you'll be talking about, there's a, there's a regulation on cost. You understand, control of substances and, and as others to, uh, to help. So there are so many regulations, but I might not be like stating them one after the other, but it is good that we focus on every regulation that is connected to whatever we do. So uh, apart from that, it is important that in managing workplace biological and chemical hazard, it is very, very important we look at training. Okay, training and education is very important, which is very, very important. So basically, if we go back to how we um, conduct risk assessment, which cannot be, uh, we cannot um, overemphasize it because no matter what form the hazard exists, there must be a risk assessment whereby we have to identify hazard, we have to assess this hazard, introduce different kind of control measures and all that, you know, and analyze the risk, you know, to know the level at which um, if worker is exposed to such uh, chemical or biological um, agent or substances, how the severity will look like, then from there we'll be able to provide solution to, to all this. So basically, like I said, I want to focus on um, um, the biology the, or the biological hazard, for example. If we, if we really look at um, um, biological hazard, you know, they, they occur mostly in, in the product or, or contaminants, you know, within our work processes, okay? And some biological agents can be, we can find them between our environment, okay? Which could be coming from maybe um, animals or insect transmission, there's what we call zoonosis or something like that. So all these things could be found from the environment. Also, when you look at communicable disease, which is brought from outside, to an organization and also transmit from one worker to another. You know, when you look at fuel, this airborne, look at during the time of COVID, you see what, what, what happened. All these are all these are basic uh, uh, forms of biological hazard, you know, and most of all these things, they get through the body through different means, you know, through the nose tree, through the screen, skin, skin through body, um, body contact, either through fuels and all that. So, so many forms of, uh, uh, in which this um, bacteria fungi can get into the um, into the into the human system, and you know it is very important that part of the way we manage this situation, there must be an emergency management uh, and a kind of emergency arrangement on the ground, you know, to be able to manage it. You know, it's just like look at what happened during COVID; it shaked the world. The entire world it shaked the entire world. You know, we were able to find out to see those countries that have a good health system, you know, and, you know, kudos to Qatar. We are here in Qatar. In fact, they, 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 they did so very well to contain, you know, the, the, the situation. A lot of measures were in place, you know, so a lot of companies' eyes were open because that is where you see a contingency plan begin to set in. A lot of companies begin to see reason why they should have a contingency plan when it comes to um, issue of pandemic, um, disease outbreak, and things like that. So it's not just about fire. It's not just about earthquake. You know, 
infectious um, um, disease explosion like that could uh, could, um, could 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 get things worse, you know, for an organization. So, for me, it is very important that we understand all this factor. Okay, so because now when we look at uh, uh, part of the way we control maybe biological hazard, for example, you discover that sometimes these are situations that you cannot eliminate. They might just be there. Like when we say airborne and disease or something like that. See, no matter how you try, they are just there. You cannot probably eliminate or say you want to substitute some, but some you can do such. Okay, then basically I want to focus on the engineering, administrative, and personal protective equipment. You know, like in most cases, we'll be more focused to biological hazard. One of the ways we can control it, we can contain the situation is to ensure that, you know, in biological hazard, you see more is within the healthcare sector, sector unlike construction. You have more of this hazard found in the, probably the laboratory, either in the higher institution and things like that. So basically there's what we call a kind of an enclosure, okay, like an access control room for biohazardous or biohazardous um, safety cabinet, where you see like, I could remember when I was doing my research during my undergraduate, I could remember we, have, we went to the University College Hospital in Ibadan to get some sample of bacterium, you know? So if we imagine, I have to, we have to incubate, we have to do a lot of things, so there's this um, in a in a in a uh, laboratory in school. There we have this safety cabinet where things are preserved, things are stored, so that they don't um, get uh, either contaminated or or get um, people infected by all those things. Because we deal with real sample of micro um, organism that was extracted from human. Because my project was we used the medicinal plants. You know we we're trying to do some analysis to focus on the effect of the medicinal plants on all these um, organisms and all that. So, which was fantastic. And uh, um, by virtue of uh, my hard work, this research work was published, you know, was published in 2013 with the head of my supervisor. So it's, 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 it's a very wonderful work, which if any of you are interested, I can also share that publication. So that just by the way, then uh, basically we could also employ what we call local exhaust ventilation system, you know, which include high efficiency particulate um, air filter. Also, we have these fume woods, mechanical ventilation, natural ventilation. So this will go both for the biological and chemical hazard, depending on um, the setting, you know, the work environment, like I've said, we might not see all this setting in the construction. We might find them in the laboratory, we might find them in the healthcare sectors and all that, hospital and all that. So basically, and especially the high um, efficiency particular matter, that is why you see most in most homes, like for me in my house now, I discovered recently, last week I bought this um, air purifier, okay, because I discovered that my son always have allergy, you know, after some time with the AC, because I was even thinking of a way where we can even find an opportunity to do a, um, our discussion on indoor air quality, though it's also a broad um, kind of topic on its own, because a lot of things happen indoor, you know. So that is why it is uh, in some cases they advise because we the sources of all those contamination within the indoor um, air to come from the materials that were used to build the, the the rooms or the building and what comes from outside through the AC and all that. So basically, um, that just uh, by the way, like, like I've said, then when we look at the administrative control of this um, hazard, either from the chemical side or the biological, we must be able to implement what we call standard operating procedure. There must be procedure in place in order to control such hazard um, administratively. Like I mentioned earlier, training, which is part of administrative control, can never be emphasized. It's very important. Also, housekeeping on the issue of how the, uh, the, the area is well cleaned, you know, how is well disinfect, how we disinfect this area and environment is very important. We could imagine during the time of COVID, you could see the procedure that were laid in place for us to wash our hands, to clean all surfaces and all that, or sanitize. 
So all these things are way to control. And we could see that this they, they were practical. They worked a lot. Okay. And a lot of people were using um, nose marks as well, you know, to, to prevent, you know. So it depends on the 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 um how dangerous this uh, uh bacteria, fungi, or whatever the organism might be, or the chemical substances could be, because some can just pass even through N95 no um, and respirator or whatever. So sometimes we'll be able to understand the nature of this um, organism or chemical substance to be able to determine what kind of nose protection, you know, or respiratory protection we can also use, you know. And um, we need to design a kind of infection control program on sites, you know, and also personal hygiene is very, very important. Like I said, you cannot touch your hand with so many contaminated areas and start eating. So these were part of uh, the process to contain um, a lot of things during the COVID, despite the emphasis on personal hygiene, which is very, very important. And we could see the effectiveness of uh, PPE during that period also, because in as much as other aspects of engineering and administrative, administrative control were in place, we could see how sophisticated the PPE were. So these, all these things, like I always say, and I will always reiterate is that no matter how it is, even if engineering and administrative control is still there. That does not mean that we are not going to use PPE because there are some situations, you imagine during the time of COVID, yes, you put all administrative control. Don't look at the PPE. Definitely you get infected. So sometimes, you know, that's why some people want to argue, but from the safety perspective, we know PPE is the last result, you know? But sometimes when you look at it, you just find out that the PPE itself does a lot of preventive measure, you know, even if some administrative control decide to fail or engineering control decide to fail. So that is just that. These are not things that we should be able to argue as an expert and all that. It has been established that PPE is always the last result of all those things. So we need to emphasize on the correct type of PPE to be used depending on the hazard. We have to decide if this PPE also uh, can fit the individual because you cannot use a PPE that is not fitted for the purpose it is uh, required for. So otherwise, people could still get infected if it is not properly fitted for the individual. So basically, um, um, these are the these are the things I just wanted to know regarding the management of biological hazard. Um, basically, so I will try to give Mr. Johnson the uh, the floor now because I'm running out of time as well uh, to pour more light on some areas that I'm unable to touch, especially in the area of chemical hazard. And so for other professionals to make their own um, contribution with respect to uh, the topic for today. Thank Sorry. you very much. Yeah. Sorry, please, before you hang on, I I want to, I just, it's not be long I joined that down there. I, I discovered that uh, you have laid more emphasis on this uh, biological uh, hazard. Okay. You made mention of uh, using PPE to be the last uh, option. Mm. Where, where we have uh, other control measures that mm. are highly recommended. Yes. But you didn't throw more light on the engineering control part of the hazard. Engineering okay, control. hazard. Mm. I really want to know if it's one or two engineering control that would have been in, be in place apart from the PPA. Praise that. Thank you. Okay, okay. Now, like 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 I'm like I was saying, you know, when it comes to biological hazard, you discover that um, because I know most of us who might be in the area of construction, for example, but you see, like I said, more more of the biological hazard. You see them, especially in the laboratories, in the healthcare sec sectors, okay? So that is, if you go there, that is where you see more of this hazard, okay? So in, in those area, but in construction, you will not be expecting them to have a kind of enclosure, you know, to contain or to protect, maybe having a kind of safety cabinet, because the kind of, the kind of um, infection you find in construction, maybe bacteria, virus, and all those things, you could just get them from the environment and things like that. But in the academic setting, in the, in the research lab, uh, making micro, micro, microbiology lab and so on and so forth, 
in the hospital and clinic and all that. So there's what we call there's a, there's a kind of enclosure system they have where you have a kind of a, a, a control access to a particular room. People don't just get there. People that get there will be able to have keep up with their PP to be able to deal with this organism. You know that was why I make references to the research I did when I was an under, undergraduate then in the university. But just for the purpose of time, then also we have a kind of what we call biohazard. I am by as that just um, safety cabinet, you know. So in that cabinet, all those kind of organisms, you know, that they use for research, they use for tests in the laboratory. All those things are being stored there. They don't just keep it in an even, um, open environment so that people don't get um, contaminated with it. So it's a kind of enclosure. They call, they call it by as uh, just um, safety cabinet. Then for the local exhaust ventilation system. They could come in different form, like in, like what we have in the construction where we have this uh, mechanical ventilation, for example, to control this. Um, it could be fumes, it could be this um, uh, maybe dust and all that. You know, here there we are not talking about biological, but in the area of biological, we also have what we call um, um, this local exhaust ventilation that they normally install at in, in different rooms, especially in the Middle East. It's also help in the area of biological as as well. There's what we call um EPA filter. Okay, like when you look at the air purifier, more 99% of the air purifier that you find at home to even improve air quality, they contain EPA filter. And what does this filter do? They entrap, they entrap all those microorganisms, bacteria, fungus, molds, you know, and all that, you know, to be able to give good quality because most of those things that cause allergy are bacteria, viral infection that we find within the home. This might be extracted from outside. People can also bring it from outside at the same time. Okay, so basically, for we in the construction, we might not really have more on the engineering control as compared to those who work in the other sector, like I've mentioned um, earlier. So I don't know if my point is clear to you. Thank, thank you very much. You you just hit it in the nail. Uh, on the, the, you just hit the nail on the head because what I wanted to know is uh, in the construction side of it, and it, mm. it, this. What you just said last night, just clear it for me. Okay. That you said you don't see it much compared to people in the lab. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. OK. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Steve. Welcome. For that wonderful presentation. We've taken uh, part of your time. So yes. let us proceed uh, from here. Uh, Mr. Steven has uh, done some summary of biological hazards. So let me start with chemical hazards. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. OK. So for chemical hazards, we are talking about those uh, substances that has a potential to cause physical or health hazard because of their chemical properties. So they are called chemical hazard because they contain some uh, chemical properties, which is uh, one of the reasons or maybe part of the major reason why they can cause uh, physical or uh, health uh, injuries. So we are talking about things like uh, flammable gases, or we'll talk about uh, compressed uh, gases, oxidizers, explosives, uh, carcinogenic uh, substances. So these are types of chemical hazards that exist in the workplace. Now, as health and safety professionals, for every chemical that is used in the workplace, we are mandated by uh, cost regulation to conduct chemical risk assessment. That is what we call cost assessment. So this cost assessment is an avenue, an opportunity for us to actually identify the hazards associated with use of that chemical, specifically as it applies to our workplace. So the way you use it in your workplace or the, the function or the uh, particular reason why you purchase that chemical might be different from what other people use that chemical for in their own uh, workplace. So that cost assessment 
is what will help you to identify that hazard associated with that chemical, especially when it has to do with your workplace specifically. So cost assessment So cost assessment is a specific assessment of the chemical use in the workplace as it has to do with your workplace specifically. So in that instance, that is when you will now be able to identify the types of chemical hazards that uh, you are prone to based on the chemical being used. So some of them could be carcinogenic. Carcinogenic simply means that they have potential to cause cancers. Some of the chemicals can be irritants. That means they are skin sensitizers. They can, they will irritate the skin or irritate the eyes or can irritate the respiratory tract. Okay. Some of them can be corrosive as well. They can cause eye damage. Some chemicals can be explosives. Some of them can be oxidizers. Some of them can be uh, hazardous to aquatic uh, environment or to the entire environment themselves. So these are types of chemical hazards. Now, the major information you need about every chemical lies in your safety data sheet. So for every chemical that is supplied to you in your workplace, should be accompanied with a safety data sheet. And the, some of the wrong practices that happens in this part of the world is that chemicals are supplied with a safety data sheet. And we start running around, start browsing the internet to get the safety data sheet. That is not the right practice. So the best practice is that the manufacturer of every chemical supplies you the safety data sheet while supplying that uh, uh, hazardous uh, material to you. So that is how it's supposed to be done. Now, let's talk. Uh, I know that others will contribute in this, so that is why I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to emphasize more on any of them. Now let's look at biological hazards. So they are also known as uh, biohazards because they are referred to biological substances that can cause uh, health effects or ill health or can cause uh, damage to the uh, human body. So most of these biological hazards uh, are like bacterials in form of viruses, in form of fungi, parasites, in form of biological toxins, just like uh, Mr. Steven has laid some emphasis on them. But I want to uh, make some emphasis on uh, where these biological hazards are, can be uh, imminent in our workplaces. There are different types of workplaces. So depends on the industry or depending on the workplace, we'll see if biological hazards exist in most of them. So the first one is can be found in sharp waste. So people that use sharp objects like needles, razors, so maybe because of contamination or because of uh, being used on an infected person or infected animal, or maybe because of the uh, uh, sharp object has rusted or has undergone some uh, chemical uh, formations. So there can be a carrier of these biological hazards. So when these uh, sharp objects that are contaminated get uh, uh, in contact with the human body, it can directly pierce or it can directly uh, pass through the skin, thereby uh, transmitting these uh, biological uh, hazards or biological agents into the human blood, thereby contaminating the, the person. So the other type of biological hazard is the molds and the yeast. So these are common in wet, uh, wet areas in the workplace. For example, the basement that is very cold and maybe you have uh, accumulated water or you have uh, 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 some uh, non-flowing uh, water there. So these are easier way for this fungi to thrive in this environment. 
So they are they cause uh, certain uh, health risk, and the easiest means of uh, uh, going inside the human body is through inhalation. They can be inhaled, and they can also go uh, to the human through contact with the skin. They can cause allergic reactions to sensitive individuals like sneezing, itching, uh, skin rashes. So these are some of the uh, health effects uh, of this mold and yeast. Another biological hazard I'll talk about are organic materials. We Organic materials such as garbages, wastewater, sewage water, plant materials, even organic dust. So these are some, some of the sources of uh, viruses and fungi, even parasites that when they come in contact, when our human skin come in contact with these organic materials, we they tend to uh, cause uh, sensitizations, they can cause irritations on the skin. They can also uh, lead to other high uh, degrading uh, indices. So, who are the people that are mostly at risk to these organic uh, materials? The people in charge of disposing waste, the, maybe the cleaners in the workplace, the people uh, disposing uh, sewage waste, the people gathering uh, all the human waste, even the uh, organic waste. So these people are at high risk of contact with this uh, 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 biological hazards. Now, another form of biological hazard that we are exposed to in the workplace are stinging incense. So incense like bees, spiders, or uh, hornets. So these incense, in, in as much as they just cause physical harm or physical injury or pains, they can also transmit some venous in the human body, which will... Uh, cause other adverse uh, reactions, like uh, allergies, like uh, anaphylaxis. So these are some of the effects of uh, some biological hazards that we face in the workplace. Now, how do we control these hazards, both the chemical and the biological hazards? The COSH regulation 2002 is one of the uh, most uh, set aside regulations that gives guidelines on how chemical hazards and biological hazards are supposed to be managed in the workplace. So like I said in the beginning, the first approach is to uh, conduct risk assessment. And when it involves chemicals or hazardous uh, substances, uh, cost assessment is the first thing that needs to be done. That will help you to identify the specific uh, hazards or specific risk that the workplace is exposed to. Now, the next thing to do is to ensure that everybody in that workplace is uh, trained information and communication. People should be aware of the type of hazard that they are exposed to, the type of risk that they're exposed to, and the type of uh, chemical that they are uh, exposed to. So they should be aware of the side effects of the chemicals or the hazardous uh, hazards that are in the workplace. So training, information, communication comes next uh, in, uh, in that uh, control. Now, the other form of control is head surveillance. Health surveillance comes in form of monitoring the head status of the workers who are exposed to either this chemical or biological hazards, trying to detect the ill health earlier on. Because if the effects are detected earlier on, it's easier to treat or it's easier to uh, treat the health effects than allowing it to accumulate or maybe get to a later stage. So, Head surveillance should be carried out on workers who are exposed to chemicals and biological uh, hazards.
So emergency response to outbreaks. So uh, organizations or workplaces that are that have uh, activities involving use of chemicals and other biological hazards should have emergency response uh, procedure in place. In case there is an outbreak, in case uh, the, there is chemical spillage, what are the emergency response that will be in place? So there should be an emergency response uh, procedure in place for arresting uh, exposure or uh, uh, adverse effects of these uh, hazardous substances or maybe uh, biological uh, agents. So adhering to cost regulation is one of the uh, legal requirements that every workplace that is uh, that is exposing workers to hazardous substances should uh, implement. Now, personal protective equipment are very necessary because when the engineering controls, administrative controls, all these, even though they are all in place, personal protective equipment are also uh, a necessary requirement to ensure that the workers are adequately protected. And the personal protective equipment should be properly selected to fit properly to the worker and to ensure that they fit also with other, other uh, PPEs. So for biological waste, it should be properly uh, collected. There should be a procedure for safe collection of uh, biological waste. And uh, the team managing the biological waste should be uh, regulated. They should be uh, trained. They should have proper procedure for collecting and management of biological waste. So not anybody should be allowed to uh, handle biological waste. Now, another control is containment. Just like uh, Mr. Steven said, in the laboratories or industries that deals with uh, high quantity of uh, biological hazard or biological waste, they have containment procedure whereby only authorized people are allowed to go inside those locations. Then another control is ventilation, improvement in ventilation, ensuring that the ventilation system in the play, in the workplace is sufficient. It could be forced ventilation. It could be also uh, natural ventilation. So this ventilation system should be adequate to ensure that the uh, air quality is very uh, sufficient, is very good, and the the accumulation of these chemicals are not are not uh, seen. Also. Designating areas for storage of chemicals, ensuring that only authorized people with a training are allowed to handle uh, chemicals or biological uh, agents. Cleaning and the the contamination is also another form of uh, control, ensuring that after the work has been done, uh, they are properly cleaned using cleaning agents and disinfectants to ensure that all the biological agents are properly uh, cleaned so that they cannot uh, uh, affect or be passed on to others. Training and education is cannot be overemphasized. People should be properly trained on how to use personal protective equipment. Uh, they should also be trained on signs and symptoms so that they will be able to realize when they are, uh, they are being infected with either biological or chemical uh, agents. So emergency response should be in place as well. Then compliance to regulations. Every industry have a regulation uh, uh, that they are supposed to comply with. So if you are working in oil and gas or construction or in, in the health industry, so your organization should ensure that you are complying with what the uh, the legal requirements in that uh, industry. So I will stop here for now, and uh, I'll give I'll give the floor for Engineer Hayat to uh, contribute. Do you know how you can share your screen?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here in the present. So let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah, well, my screen is visible to you. No, not yet. No, it's okay. No, check again. I cannot see it. Okay. I don't know if others can see it. For me, I cannot see it. From... No, 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 we cannot see it. Okay. No, we can. We can see it. Uh, yeah, it's coming up now. It's gone out again. Give me a few moments. Well, maybe there are some issues, but I will try to speak. Okay, go ahead. Actually, the chemical and biological hazards in the workplace have the potential to cause adverse health effects, such as breathing problems, burns, skin diseases, and cancers. So in this regard, workplace air sampling data collected by compliance officers and workers so that compensation data are being used to identify trends in exposures, injuries, and illness. So you know, there are multiple chemical agents types is, exist in the workplace, especially dust, fume, fibers, powders, and liquids, which include vapors and mist and gases. So there are multiple different forms of further chemical may be present for different kinds of hazards. For example, you know, agents in solid form may not be hazardous, but if ground it into a powder, but as it may be hazardous when breathed into the lungs. So that will be more harmful at the workplace. So there are many classifications of chemical substance hazardous to the health, which are listed here, forms of chemical agents, like as a fumes, gases, vapors, liquids. So these are all generated by the processes and work activities. So due to for the reduction purposes, we can change the process and we can reduce the quantity of being used at different workplace environments. You know, UN globally harmonized systems are being used for the classification and labeling of chemicals for hazardous effect of substance, such as, you know, acute toxicity and skin irritation, serious eye damages and carcinogenicity, as you discussed, Stefan, and you know, reproductive toxicity. There are a lot of classifications exist there for under the global harmonized systems. Further, you know, criteria based on the acute toxicity and skin corrosions and reproductive toxicity and aspiration hazards. You know, further for classifications, physiochemical effects examples are which are highly flammable and explosives which have severe health effects and environmental effects. Under the European regulations, you can further explore classifications and labeling and packages of substance and mixtures. You know, safety data sheets is very much important for considering all relevant precautions before being employed in the workplace in view of chemical substances. So further, Methodology of being implemented for managing hazardous chemical at the workplaces. There are four methods, you know, in which you are trying to assess and identify the hazards and try to carry out the risk assessments and uh, trying to factors which are being evaluated, the risk to determine the magnitude of the adverse effects. The second one, when you have carried the risk assessment, you can decide the effective control measures to terminate or minimize the risks. And also, hierarchy of control, you can be implemented. 
in order to implement the different controls to reduce the risk associated with the hazardous chemicals and control measures. Further, you know, the control measure must be proportional to the health risks. When deciding the control measures, you must have to be considered the nature of the hazards, the frequency and duration of exposure, number and type of people exposed to the chemical and biological hazards. So our overall classification and mitigation and risk evaluation processes are being used. And further, you know, classification of chemical agents have some acute and chronic effects on our health. Especially if you are talking about the acute, these are the short term effects with high level exposure and have quick effect like as exposure to the high concentrated chlorine gas. And health effects symptoms of acute coughing, nausea, drowsiness, and eye irritations. And in view of and in respect of chronic, have long-term effects, lower level exposures, and multiple exposures to asbestos, and have health effects symptoms like a sudden asthma attack, difficult breathing, tightness in the chest, and severe itching. Further, classification of chemical agents used different terminologies like toxicity, dose, local effects, systematic effect, and target organs. You know, we just not limited to risk elimination and reduction. We are daily basis exposed to the chemical hazards at the workplaces. So like as a production of chemicals, handling of chemicals, storage of chemicals, and transport of chemicals, and release of chemicals resulting from work activities. Maintenance and repairs and cleaning of equipments. These are all the activities where the biological and chemical hazards, everyday worker being exposed to the workplace activities. So we just need to be under uh, our working conditions, maintain the exposure limit level for chemical and biological hazards. You know, the uh, the chemical and biological hazards in the workplace have the potential cause to the adverse cells. So that's why we are being most widely used the limits for threshold limit values and also time weighted average values. The time weighted average values have exposure limits and also the short term and long term and ceiling limit values. So these are the values which are being implemented in the workplace activities according to the worker schedule and cap bearing capabilities. And the further we are going towards occupational exposure limits for calculating point of view, the occupational exposure limits are being calculated on the basis of PPM to M milligram per meter cubic. You know, the work exposure limits in MG milligram per meter cubic is equivalent to the work exposure limit in PPM into molecular weight. So we just need to be calculated before entering into any chemical exposure environment. We just have to be implemented these calculation procedures before going there. And further, why we need to prevent and implement the controls to control the chemical and biological hazards. You know, the goal of chemical and biological hazard prevention is to help prevent occupational diseases and adverse health effects. The preferred approach include innovation in control, effective use of existing knowledge, promoting new approaches to safety issue, the need to provide safety equipment such as gloves or face shields, aprons, safety googles, safety shoes, respiratory protective equipment and others. So, what are the rights of the workers while working on the very highly hazardous and biological and chemical places? Federal law entitled worker to safe workplace means employer must keep workplace free of known health safety hazards. Worker have the right to speak up about hazards without fear of retaliation. Worker also have the right and receive workplace safety and health training in a language you understand. You know, be protected from the toxic chemicals, requests and enforcement inspections and speak to the inspectors, report an injury, illness and get copies of your medical records. 
review records of work related injuries and illness, see result of tests taken to find workplace hazardous. These are all the needs to prevent or control the chemical and biological hazards. And the last but not the least, we need to be under consider risk control hierarchy, means eliminating chemical, substituting with hazardous alternatives, engineering control, administrative control, and PPs. So that's all about it from my side, especially a focus on the chemical and but minor to the biological. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Junior Tayab, for that uh, wonderful contribution. All right, so it's already seven o'clock, but we can take a few minutes to take contribution from others. So anybody that wants to uh, contribute can can go ahead. Now you have finished your speaking. That's when your screen came up. All right. So if there's no further uh, contribution, we can we can call it a day. So if you have any question, you may ask me so that I can reply appropriately. So I'm really apologizing to the session because due to some problems, I was unfortunately could not uh, display my slides. That's okay, no problem. We heard you clear. Your, your explanations, you are very clear. And we learned from it. Okay, so I think we've had enough for today. So thank you guys for for attending thank today. you all yeah okay thank you guys thank you sir francis uh thank you harry and uh david the two davids thank you guys for coming yeah thank you very much <laughs> just david <laughs> All right, so we'll see you again next week to stop uh, to discuss another topic. All right, guys, do you have a Good nice one, David? Hold on. Thank you so much, yeah. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank you, Henry. Have a nice Good night, guys. Good night. Yeah, good night. <laughs>